So they developed a matrix form for it. And they came up with the imaging condition. In air, it was just one over the object distance plus one over the image distance equals one over the focal length. Where the distances are measured from the object to the principal plane. So the object distance is the object to the first principal plane, the image distance is the distance of the second principal plane to the image. Right? And the focal length is the effective focal length. Okay, so keeping those things in mind, we can define magnification, which is the next important parameter, is what is the size of the image with respect to the object? As we remember, we did this with similar triangles last time. It was as simple as that. The lateral magnification is just x prime divided by x, which uh, is just 1 minus p s prime by n prime, or it's just the image distance divided by the object distance, right? Okay. Same thing happens when we have angular magnification, and we all see this in the design of the telescope. So lateral magnification obviously is useful for a microscope. Angular magnification is useful for a telescope, right? So if you're looking at stars far away, there are points, essentially, and you're just trying to uh, distinguish them coming in at different angles, essentially, and that's referred to angular magnification. And all that means is that you come in with one cone of angle. One way to look at it, anyway, is that if, 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 let's say you have a cone of angles coming in from one of the object points, defined as delta alpha, and you have a cone of incoming angles forming the image point, the corresponding image point of delta alpha, delta alpha prime, and then the angular magnification is just how much has that cone of angles changed. Okay, so it's delta alpha prime divided by delta alpha. And you can do it the exact same way as we did with similar triangles. Okay? Or just from the matrix, matrix uh, equations as well. And you'll get an expression such as this, which is exactly the same as the lateral magnification, but just scaled by the if there are changes in the refractive index. Right? These two things are the same if you are in air. <clears throat> okay? So just to summarize what we've seen for matrix uh, optics, we had the generalized imaging condition and we defined the uh, optical transformation that happens to rays with just a simple matrix, two by two matrix. And the image and the object are defined by the angle of the ray and the position of the ray. Okay, it's as simple as that. So it's one ray that's been typically, as you will see, in uh, ray tracing software, people go through millions of rays, right? So you do this sort of operation over ma many, many, many times. Where you change the angle, change the position, and so on. So that's the object input, that's the image output, and th those are the metrics, M11, M12, M21, M22. And those are the basic conditions that define that matrix and when you're forming an object in an image under imaging conditions, right? So power p is minus of that term. Imaging condition is that that term is zero, which of course is just the dependence on the pos of the position on the angle, right? Remember we mentioned that it's the logic of an imaging condition, that all the rays that come from one point end up at another point irrespective of their angle. Okay, lateral magnification is just that term. Again, it's just this divided by that. Angular magnification is this term, but now scaled by the change in refractive index and so on. This term, by the way, the scaling of refractive index will, will, will come back to it. It's a, an important parameter in solar concentrators. And we'll come back to that. But for now, it's really not so important. Why? Because we, we're imaging in air, right? It's always air to air. Okay, there are a few other things that you should be aware of. Uh, just not terribly important for us right now, but uh, which you might have heard before, aperture stop and field stop. The aperture stop, so if you have an object, you have a lens, uh, and you're forming an image, the aperture stop is essentially, uh, it limits the amount of energy reaching each image point. So it's a way to limit aberrations of the lens. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, so you can see what the aperture stop is doing is it's, uh, it uh, limits some of the rays which are coming at very large angles. So the small angle rays pass through, but the large angle ray does not block. That's basically the purpose of it. Okay, and the formal definitions in the next slide. We'll come to that in a second. Field stop, on the other hand, it basically limits the size of the image. Okay, they're slightly different. So you'll see. Field stop is at the image, image plane itself in this particular case. 
doesn't have to be. Okay. And the, <clears throat> the entrance pupil is the image of the aperture stop seen from the object side. Okay. So imagine you have an aperture stop, you have a lens, and you're imaging, you're forming the image of an object shown here. But if you look from this side you will see a virtual image of the aperture stop as shown by these uh, um, outlines, rectangles, right? just like we drew two classes ago. And that's referred to as the entrance pupil. All that says is that it is the angular aperture of the imaging system. Okay? Now, the, uh, the angular aperture is important uh, you know, for those of you who might have, uh, who might do photography, you, you, you remember angular aperture is important because it, it determines how uh, good your resolution will be, how small of features can you see, for instance. Okay, uh, we'll talk briefly about that also, but for now, just be aware of these definitions. The exit pupil is the same thing, but on the other side, if you have an aperture stop, which is on in front of the lens, which is also possible, because remember, all you're trying to do is you're trying to block the rays. You can block them either after the lens or before the lens, right? You're trying to block the large angle rays. Then, in that case, the exit pupil is the image of the aperture stop seen from the image side. And you will, again, form a virtual image, and it determines the cone of the maximum angle of the cone of rays that can reach the image. Basically, right? Okay. So, so that kind of brings us to the end of all our talk on lenses, and that's as much as we will do for now. Okay, we'll come back to those some of the systems later on. So, very briefly, we'll talk about mirrors and prisms, and these are fairly straightforward. You know what they are, but we'll look at this uh, a little bit in a in a bit more contextual manner. So. We've seen this before, so I'm going to skip through that. Uh, so that, okay, it's the same thing. Okay, prisms. Uh, the prisms can have many shapes. So typically, it's just uh, a prism made of a glass. Typically, so if you have light coming in, it'll because the index of glass is higher than that of air, it will bend towards the normal. And when it comes from high index medium to low index medium, it will go away from the normal. Okay, so larger angle here, smaller angle there. Snell slot, right? Okay, you can also, of course, have total internal reflection going from glass to air. So if you come in, for instance, this way, and if this angle with respect to this normal is larger than the critical angle, you'll get total internal reflection, then total internal reflection again. Okay, pretty straightforward. This is useful, this is what's called a corner prism. Uh, sends the beam straight back in the same direction it came from. And these are used in, uh, uh, for instance, uh, actually, one of these was placed on the moon to reflect the light back so you can, you know, the physics experiments, for instance, you measure the speed of light, things like that. You see why, right? You shoot a laser up there, it will bounce back and come back the same way. Okay. The, some details, so if you have a prism, or a refracting prism, and if you define the angles as follows, you have the incident angle A, uh, refract, first refracted angle A prime, then another angle B prime. Remember, they're all measured with respect to the normal to the surface. Okay, then you have an angle B. Then you can define <coughs> two things that are important. One is the apex angle of the prism. In this case, I'm assuming an isosceles prism, isosceles triangle, uh, theta and the refractive index n, and that defines everything else in terms of the geometry. Okay? And we can assume a symmetric case for simplicity, uh, a equals b, a prime equals b prime, it's also an isosceles triangle. Then these angles are theta over 2, and theta plus d over 2. Now d is what's referred to as the deviation of the prism. Okay? It's the deviation, angular deviation with which the output ray goes out with respect to the input ray. So how much it is bent? Yeah, that's an important condition. We have a, we can just apply Snell's law and get what's called the prism equation, just sine d plus theta over two, divided by sine theta over two is n, over one, 
that they have one index of it. Just from Strauss law, you can work that out. And that way, you, once you know the apex angle and the refractive index, you know how much light will deviate by in the symmetric case. Now, you can have rays coming in at a asymmetric rays not equal to B, then of course this will be different. But it's just geometry. You can work it out. In ray tracing, of course, we need to take this sort of stuff into account as well, right? Uh, in, you know, because you could have prisms in your system. For instance, you know, you, you may uh, consider using prisms to separate spectral bands of sunlight to, to absorb uh, uh, the light uh, in a more efficient manner. We'll talk briefly about that also. Okay, so that's a, one interesting way to do it. So we need to be able to analyze it. Okay, so which brings us to dispersion. Uh, Refractive index is a function of wavelength, which means as you, if you come in with white light, you get different colors. Right? Uh, you've seen Newton's famous experiment. And like I said, one interesting application of this in energy is you can set in sunlight and get the different colors out and absorb the different colors much more efficiently than you could absorb just white light. So we'll talk more about it later on in the class. Okay, so. The dispersion, a measure of dispersion is what's called the dispersive power or the dispersive index. And these are again standard uh, definitions because if you look up a stock uh, item in one of the optics companies and this, they will list these for prisms so you should know what they are. Uh, they are usually measured with respect to some reference color lines because they, they vary with color, right? The refractive index changes. So they have C, D, F, uh, C is red, about 656 nanometers, D is yellow, 589 nanometers, and F is blue, about 486 nanometers, and they define them at these uh, wavelengths, okay? So crown glass, for instance, has refractive index at the blue of 1.529, uh, uh, in the yellow of 1.523, in the, in, the, in the red of 1.520, so on and so forth, right? So you have a small variation. And you can define what's called a dispersive power, which is basically how much will the different wavelengths be separated in angle. That's the measure of it. Okay. So in some applications, you want these to be separated very far apart. In some application, you may not. And that measure of how separated it is is typically defined by what's called dispersive power or dispersive index. It's just the inverse of each other. So you can see all, all it does is it just calculates the difference between the refractive indices at the two ends of the spectrum, visible spectrum, right? Red and blue, divided by just uh, the index at yellow minus one. Okay. I'll give you okay, so just very simple. The Simple loss of reflection for mirrors. You're very familiar with that. If you have an object there, you'll form an image there. If you look from this side, you'll form the image there, right? So you're very familiar with this. Uh, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And the normal to the surface and the rays here all should lie in the same plane, just like in refraction. When we talked about that, when we talked about refraction. Okay. Of course, mirrors act as lenses as well. Right? You can focus light with mirrors. You've seen some pictures of parabolic uh, concentration. If you have a plane mirror, it has zero power because the radius of curvature is infinite. You will see that the power of a mirror is related to its radius of curvature, inversely related to radius of curvature, just like for a lens. One interesting thing is the image is always virtual. Okay? And uh, laterally inverted, as, as we know. Okay. Shift it in both directions. Yeah, simple stuff. Now, the conventions for reflection are the same as that for we talked about for refraction as well, for, for lenses and so on. Uh, here that we assume light's traveling from left to right before the reflection, but after reflection going from right to left. Okay, again, this is just a convention I'm using for this, and it's not necessarily standardized. Just, uh, this convention is useful when you are trying to do just uh, all the analysis with matrices. That's all. Like, but again, what's important is you want to have a sense for what is happening to the light. 
Radius of curvature is positive. The surface is convex towards the left, which is the same as for a lens. Um, oh, sorry, no. For a lens, it was concave to the left. If you remember. Is that right? I, no, I, that now. I think it is. We'll have to go back and check. I think it is. L longitudinal distances before reflection are positive, pointing to the right. Which means, you, you know, if you're measuring distances away from the optical axis, the object is standing up, it's positive. If it's standing down, it's negative. And after reflection, it's reversed. Again, you don't need to memorize any of this. Just follow the rays, and it will make sense. Um, to the left. Oh, this should be um, that should be lateral distances, not longitudinal distances. So there's a typo there. The ray angles are measured the same way. So they are obtained by measuring in the counter counterclockwise direction is positive. Okay, to an acute angle. Okay. So we'll see some examples so make some sense out of, out of this. So if you have a spherical mirror, so it's a portion of the sphere with the radius of curvature r, the light that comes in parallel to the optical axis is reflected to a single point there. Okay? And that, of course, is the focus. And we can calculate what the focus is with relation to the radius of curvature. Okay? In the paraxial approximation. Not true at very large angles. Okay? Now, of course, this is very easy to calculate, right? Because this angle is equal to that angle. So this should bisect that. I mean, sorry, the, the normal should bisect that. And you can calculate that this is equal to that, and you figure out what f is. We'll see that, but simple geometry here. In uh, an imaging condition for reflective optics, again, we won't go through the details. It's, it's exactly the same as the, for lenses, as long as we follow the same sign convention. 1 over the object distance, image distance, plus 1 over the object distance equals to 1 over the focal length. And you will see for the spherical mirror, the focal length is half the radius of curvature. Okay? It's negative in this particular case because we picked a, a convex shape to the left. Okay? So focal length is just minus half of the radius of curvature. Magnification is defined exactly the same way. Lateral, the lateral magnification is just the di difference between the distances, image distance divided by object distance. Angular magnification is the inverse in this particular case. And you will see that how it is. Okay. So those are just simple geometry. Again, no need to memorize any of this, but you should go back and think about why things are the same way. I don't have time to go through all the details. Now, you can imagine a sphere is not necessarily the best focusing element as a parabola, because a parabola has two foci, and you can design it such that you can change the focal length in a more flexible manner with respect to the radius of curvature, so you'll see. Okay? So you can ask this question to find out what is the optimal shape for focusing incoming light. Okay? So what should be the shape of this surface be for the incoming parallel ray bundle to come to a perfect focus? Okay? It's relatively easy to answer, because what does that mean? That means you want to make sure that the normal to the surface always bisects this line, right? As you change it, it will bisect a different line. So you want to, I don't know if you follow what I'm saying, but you want to have some general surface here such that you pick a focus, you have another ray, okay. those are the normals, right, to the surface. All that's saying is that as a function of this distance x, you're trying to calculate what this normal should be, right, as you go away. That's all you're trying to do when you, when you ask that question. Okay. And it's just simple geometry. And if you do that, you will see that the surface will define a parabola. 
it's, it's a good exercise, but it's just geometry, so you guys can do it. Okay. Now, of course, a, a lot of times, or never, this doesn't happen. Right? The fo focus is never a perfect point. Okay, it's always usually blurred. The, some, some rays actually, instead of coming there, could come there, right sides of it. And this is referred to as an ab aberration, optical aberrations. Okay, that's an example of an aberration. There's a, many different types of it, and it, it's a very complex, very detailed subject. We will talk, talk about it very, very briefly. Okay. So essentially, an aberration is the, is the deviation of the wavefront from its ideal spherical shape due to imperfect refraction or reflection by the optical elements. So assume you had a point object, which is emanating a spherical wave, and you are trying to form a point image, which is collecting a spherical wave. Any deviation from a sphere is referred to as an aberration. And in a real world, there is nothing is perfect. So you will always have aberrations. Quite a, a, a lot of times an optical engineer spends a lot of time trying to minimize this aberration. That's basically what they do for very compl complex optical systems. Okay. Um, so for instance, you can have, uh, so this is the ideal case, you have a perfect spherical wavefront focused to a point. And you have, in this case, you have some aberrated wavefront which doesn't focus to a point. You get a bunch of different points. All the images blur. Right? Um, so in the paraxial approximation, you can have reasonably perfect wavefronts, and we'll only deal with those today. But for larger larger angles, you can have what are called primary aberrations or serial aberrations. We won't really deal much with that. You can also have a situation where the different colors behave differently, and that's referred to as chromatic aberration. Okay, so which is could come about because of many reasons. One obvious reason is that the index of refraction changes with wavelength. So if you design an optical system, let's say for the red, you might, if you illuminate it with white light, you might get the blue focusing somewhere else. It's obvious, right? And you have seen this before. If you take a lens and just look at white light, you will see some rainbow colors. And this is basically is chromatic aberration. Or if you look at the edges of an image formed by a lens, sometimes you see rainbow colors, different colors. Okay. Um, you can have what's called the longitudinal chromatic aberration, where, where the blue light comes to focus closer to the lens of the red light, which, because the blue has a higher index, for instance, in this case, which may not necessarily be always true. But, you know, different materials behave differently. Uh, you can also have, so when this happens, if you're trying to image an object, if you, let's say you're trying to image an object which is blue, you will form its image at a different location than you would form for red. So if you have an image, if you have an object which, you know, which has, let's say, the American flag or something, you will see the different bands of the colors in different locations. Or, you, or if you look at a single location, it will be blurred. Okay, that's basically what that means. Yeah. <coughs> Is that just off the top of my head? Is that kind of how uh, 3D technologies are manipulated uh, sometimes? No. no? The, the 3D looks to you like that because it's based on polarization. Well, there are a couple of ways, but they, they, they send you different polarizations of light. And obviously, your eyes can't tell the difference, but they send you different polarizations to your two eyes, which is why you wear those glasses. So you only see one polarization with one eye, the other polarization with the other eye, and they're slightly shifted to respect to each other, which gives you the 3D effect. That's the most common way, but there are other ways. But that, 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 that has nothing to do with this, actually. Okay. So 3D isn't considered an aberration, I guess? Um, uh, I mean, it's not an aberration in the traditional sense. So when we talk about imaging systems, we are trying to form the per most, the, the, an image which is closest, closest in resemblance to the object. That, that's a goal, generally. In non-imaging optics, which we will talk about next week, that's not the goal. Right? We don't really care about resembling the sun or anything like that. Okay. So different situations, I'd say. They're not comparable. Uh, okay, so it's the same thing. 
So you can correct for chromatic aberrations, of course, otherwise you know, people like me won't be seeing uh, images properly. Right? They have to these lenses have to be corrected, otherwise you will always be seeing multicolor images, uh, blurred images, right? And uh, the simplest way to correct this is to use two different materials whose dispersion properties are different. As simple as that, right? So in this particular example, you can use a combination of two kinds of glasses, in this case crown and flint. Crown is a type of glass, flint is a type of glass, to form uh, what is referred to as a dichromat. So you have two elements forming a single lens. Uh, you can have more positive power with the crown, which has very low dispersion, and flint can have a lower negative power and has high dispersion. And we didn't go into much detail of this, but very quickly, the power of such a system is just the sum of the two powers of the individual systems. So by controlling each of them, you can control the total power. <coughs> now, each power is also given by that term. So you have three things you can control for each power. You can control the refractive index, I mean, sorry, the radii of curvature of, of the two surfaces that you're making them. So typically, the way these are made, the, the ground separately, the shape separately, and then glued together. So you have some, um, some uh, freedom in selecting the radii. Even these two radii can be different, because you can fill that with optical glue. So there are lots of different things people can do in these situations. Now, um, and you can use the, uh, you can, so you can vary the refractive index and the radius of curvature, radii of curvature, to control the dispersion based on the dispersive uh, power that we talked about. Okay. So if you want a particular kind of dispersion, then that defines the powers, which is basically what's coming. So this is the, for, so if you're designing a system, this is a good, good example because this is designing a system. You are given the power, right? So you have the P, and you are given the dispersive in this dispersive uh, powers, which is basically defined by the re, uh, refractive index, right? So you can plug those in, and you can see how much power needs to go to the different types of material. From that, you can then calculate what the radii of the curvature, are, radii of curvature. Okay. So in other words, if you are given that you need to design a particular lens, FRI glasses or whatever, with a particular power, but a particular dispersive power also, you are able to do it by using two different materials. You can control the power and the dispersive power separately, basically. That's basically what it's talking about. Okay, so you typically want to minimize dispersion. Right? You want to reduce the difference between red and the blue, but still be able to see. So you have uh, high enough power for your eyes to work. Okay. It's a, just a very simple example there. To summarize uh, distortions, there's a whole host of distortions which we won't really talk about but very quickly. Uh, so we have chromatic aberration, which we just saw, which is to do with the, angle, uh, with the um, colors. Right? And you can solve it with uh, ma different materials, essentially, we just saw that. You can have something called spherical aberration, which is not wavelength related, but related to how uh, off-axis rays behave when they are incident on a uh, high power um, lens, for instance, because they will bend at different angles than what it is designed for. Okay? So you can have image blur, essentially, and that's corrected by aspherics. Now, what aspherics are, are right, still now we only talked about spherical radii curvatures. So you have two spheres. But it doesn't, need, or a paraboloid, or a parabola for reflectors. But it doesn't need to be a sphere. You can have more complex shapes, and that's referred to as an A-sphere. So you can correct for what happens to the rays out here very precisely. And this is done nowadays because you can. These are all ground with computers, machines, computer-controlled machines. So you can get very, very complex shapes and so on. Okay, and a few other. Uh, Less important aberrations, you can have coma, oblique astigmatism. Astigmatism is interesting because a lot of people have it in their eyes. Like I, I have it because you, you have a different uh, field of view in this direction versus this direction. And that's referred to as astigmatism. And that has to do with the fact that the lens of the eye is stretched in one direction with respect to the other. It's not a sphere. It's a bit elongated. So you get different powers in the two axes. 
and you're gonna curvature the field, which is actually something we saw before. If you recall, when I talked about paraxial approximation, all our uh, principal planes and focal planes and all those were planes, not surfaces, okay? But in reality, those are all surfaces. They're curved because of the way off-axis rays behave. And that's what's referred to as a curvature of the field. Now, this is important, for instance, in a camera because the CCD in a camera is a plane. But your best focal plane is not a plane where you form an image is curved. So you have to somehow take this curved image and put it onto a plane. And that's done by correcting the optics. Okay, that's what that means. And you can have distortion for uh, um, of axis rays and so on. And these things, by the way, are corrected with space doublets, which means you put a number of lenses together with a little bit of air gap in them, like we talked about before, complex optical systems. Right? OK. Uh, oh, so this is the example of a few um, related optical systems that we should be aware of as well. So in general, when designing an optical system, we look for these four things, primarily light gathering power. So if you are photon limited, for instance, when you're doing astronomy, you're not getting a lot of photons. You need to be, make sure you collect everything that you get. Okay? Uh, magnification, let's say you're doing microscopy, you want to magnify an image, or let's say you have a zoom lens for a camera, whatever. The solving power, can you form very sharp images of high enough detail, right? And finally, cost, weight, things like that. So this is kind of the overview of what you do when you, what you think about when you do optical engineering. And we'll look at a few examples, so starting with the telescope. In a telescope, all you're trying to do, uh, the simplest form of telescope is just two lenses spaced at a distance. Okay? And all you're trying to do is you have light from a distant star, which is basically parallel rays, and you're trying to send it in a certain direction to either an eyepiece where you can look at it or to a camera. Okay? So the goal in, uh, in telescopes is that you have a star which is sending light this way, and you have another star which is sending light this way, you want to tell them apart, basically. Okay? And they have some relative angle in between them. And the goal here is, and this angle is very small, we're talking about you know, arc seconds or something like that. At the and end of the day, what you're trying to do is you want to have one set of rays going that way, and I'm going to exaggerate this. Another set of rays, let's say, going that way, a much larger angle. Okay, where delta alpha prime is much, much larger than delta alpha. That's the goal here. Okay. And a simple telescope is just uh, two lenses next to each other. So if we draw, what happens here is that, of course, they will form at the focal plane in the paraxial approximation, two point images, right? Where the larger, the smaller angle will be the one closer to the optical axis, the larger angle will be the one further away from the optical axis. These will, of course, if you place this lens in the focal plane, well, if, if you place the image, uh, this lens is that the focal plane is, corresponds to this image, this focal plane. Then the, these point sources will, of course, be converted to parallel rays coming out as well at different angles determined by the front, right? So this will go out that way. I haven't drawn the rays properly, but you can imagine it, right? Now, this is in the paraxial approximation defined by that. So you basically pick the larger focal length to have a large lever arm, so you can basically bend the light long at a larger angle. That's the simplest way to think about a telescope. Of course, in a, in a real telescope, it's much more involved than that. So basically, that was shown here. And this is referred to as an objective, and that's referred to as an eyepiece, because that's what you look through, basically. 
Of course, these rays will go into your eye, and your, uh, the lens in your eye will form point images, and you will see points in your brain. Right? You won't see beams. So this is what I just said. So you know, the angular magnification is this theta prime divided by theta, or tangent at that. The small angles, you can ignore that. It's approximately the, oh, sorry, it's the opposite. So this should be f over f prime. So that's right, because you want to have a long lever arm when you form the first image. Okay, so you can separate them out. Anyway, you can work out just some simple similar triangles. Now, we can define an entrance pupil and an exit pupil in the case of a telescope as well. And the magnification can also be defined as the size of the entrance pupil to the size of the exit pupil. Now, this is a useful way to think about for a telescope because you're interested in collecting light, especially when you're looking at very far away objects that are very dim, you're getting very little light out. So you want to make sure your entrance pupil is large enough. Right? You need to collect a lot of them. And you want to make your exit pupil as small as possible because you want to get that magnification as large as possible. It's another way to think about it. It's the same thing. Okay. The angular resolution of a telescope is an important criteria because it tells you how far apart stars need to be so you can see them apart. It's a similar to the, what you can, the smallest thing you can see with a microscope. It's uh, an analogous uh, thing. Okay. So in a, the angular resolution clearly can be calculated by um, figuring out what is the smallest angle that you can resolve here. And I won't go into the details, but they're defined by <coughs> the so-called Rayleigh criteria. So in this case, Y prime. How different is Y prime from that point there? So that's the distance there. So y prime over F naught should be equal to the Rayleigh criterion. The Rayleigh criterion, we'll talk about it later on, it has to do with the microscopy. Okay. It just uh, distinguishes two point, how closely can you bring two points together before you don't see them as two different points. They blur into each other. Okay. Now, we've seen matrix optics before, so it's just, uh, in order to analyze a telescope, it's very straightforward. We have uh, three things happen. You have a thin lens, which is the objective, and you have propagation through air, through some distance d, and then you have a thin lens that's an eyepiece. This, and we've seen this before, you multiply them all out, you get that. And this is the angular magnification, and the power is zero. Okay, that's an interesting point. Okay. What else has a power zero? Yeah, plane mirror, but uh, also a, play, a lens with z infinite radius of curvature, right? Just a surface. So a telescope by itself will not form an image, because it's power zero. It can only do an angular magnification. Okay. There are a couple of different designs for a telescope. One's called the Galilean telescope, where you have a, a positive lens and the right piece is, is negative. Uh, the, the advantage of this is that they can be smaller, essentially, because it's a negative eyepiece. It gets, you can put them closer. It's f1 minus f2 as opposed to f1 plus f2, the distance. Okay, if you do the, if you think about it, it's pretty straightforward. You also have the Newtonian telescope, which is based on a parabola, where you basically um, uh, form an image of the points in some image plane. Okay. Okay, so that that brings us to the end of what we needed to know about. Um, uh, geometrical optics. Okay, I thought there were a few more things, but okay, it might be, so I'll bring it back next Tuesday. But uh, I'm going to stop here with respect to geometrical optics, but I still have a few more slides I want to talk about, about an application of optics in recycling materials, which is an interesting application that you should be aware of as well. Uh, but before I go on, are there any questions? No? Okay. So I recommend going back and reading through at least the matrix optics. You should be fairly familiar with that okay, for simple systems. So, OK, so let me move this up.
Okay. So, uh, by the way, I, I uploaded the slides again yesterday with the corrections that I made based on what we talked about on Tuesday. So the rest of the class I want to talk um, very quickly, so it'll be very brief, about optics for recycling. This is a, a bit, an interesting topic because I, I ran across this article in an in a, uh, Optical Society of America um, journal a few months ago, so in June. And this is an interesting application of optical engineering in resource recycling. Basically, um, the idea is for doing very, very high speed, very efficient sorting of different kinds of recycling materials, like different kinds of plastics, different kinds of metals, aluminum, things like that. And it's interesting because it's a very different kind of application. And you can think about how you can apply what you learned in geometrical optics with these. And I'll give you a few examples of those. Okay. So, one of the simplest applications is, uh, is what's called reverse vending machines, where basically where you drop off uh, cans of material, glasses, and things like that, and you get money for them, right? And there are a few companies that work in this space. Uh, so I, I have never heard of these, but Envico in the USA, and Winkor, Nixdorf in Germany, and Tom, and I know, I know in, in, in Europe they're much more common. I've seen them uh, much more than here. Uh, the, the big challenge for these is basically you need to identify and sort waste at high speeds. That's the speed we will come to in a second, but it's not so important here. But you need to be able to distinguish different materials. And that's a bit, bit of a challenge in an automatic fashion, and hopefully a cheap fashion as well. And uh, into multi you know, you've got to sort them into different categories, one to six, and you know, different places have different regulations and so on. And, and optics is actually a, a offer some very interesting ways to do this. First is, of course, we can do some shape measurement, okay? So whether it's a can or it's a bottle, and of course, this is not just for recycling. In shape measurement is, of course, very important for machine machine, right? If you are a robot in a car factory, how do you know where to put, how, do you, how does a robot know where to place the nut, the bolt, or whatever, or where the door goes and all that? It's based on some sort of algorithm which determines where the door is, should go. Okay, it takes a picture and does that, some, some analysis. The big challenge, of course, for resource recycling is you need high accuracy because you can have things which look very similar but they need to, they need to be sorted, for instance. Okay. So, and it needs to be relatively fast. The old technology was based on basically photo cells. So they're very, very simple. Basically, you have a conveyor belt and you have some uh, uh, photoconductive cells, basically you have a light going. Uh, you, have two, you have a source of light and you have a cell, and when the line of sight is broken, you get a signal. So you can see and how long that's broken, you can measure how long the material is and things like that. You can do all kinds of clever things with that. But it's the old technology, you should be aware of what that is. Okay. The more Advanced technology is based on laser ra range finding, and there are a lot of robots in the 90s uh, was based on this. Essentially, the idea is um, you send a modulator laser beam. So you take a laser beam, much like this, okay, and you chop, you modulate it, basically change, you know, cycle its intensity, or you can chop the beam with the chopper, much like I'm doing with my with my finger, okay, and then you look at the reflected light. It comes back, so it's an aluminum can or whatever. Okay. Now, when the light that comes back will also be modulated, right? Because it's reflected, but the phase of modulation will be shifted with respect to the original modulation. Why? Because it has traveled some distance. It is a wave traveling some distance. The phase will be shifted. By the shift of that phase, by measuring the shift of that phase, we can figure out how far away the object was, or where that reflecting point was. And then by simply scanning the laser around and looking at the time of flight of different uh, points that reflect light back, you can build up a shape. This was very, very popular. It was used in all kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, for instance, for missile guidance, and it was driven quite a bit by defense applications. And maybe like, um, I think also for, um, uh, shooting, like um, assault rifles and things like that to see how far away the target is. 
uh, you might have seen that. So again, but they're expensive. They're fairly complex systems. Oh, this is just a picture of one of those systems which was used for uh, this icon. It's essentially a 3D uh, crate imager. So they send in big crates of uh, recycled material, glass, whatever. And then, then they basically scan. So the crates right there, and they, they, they have a laser source which basically scans across. They move it, scan, and then they do the laser range finding with modulation. And they can build up 3D images relatively fast. But they are expensive. A more uh, uh, advanced approach nowadays is based on stereo vision, vision systems. Basically, the idea is that just like our eyes, we have two, two cameras, essentially. You combine two cameras and some image processing, just like we do in our brain. Okay, and this is what's commonly done today. And you can do a very fast, accurate shape recognition. One example of this, of course, is the um, uh, not, not an accurate example, but for those of you who might have seen the Microsoft Connect, which does gesture recognition. So you have a box which is able to see whether you're waving at it or whether you're doing some other gesture and so on, right? whether you're doing this, that, and so on. And that's based on the fact that, of course, you need to do 3D recognition because it's not a one plane, right? You're moving around, it's a volume. So the way, it's not exactly this approach, but uh, it, you can think about it as having just basically two cameras, taking two images in two different uh, perspectives and doing some image processing to understand what's really going on. And it's not a very simple, uh, there, there's still uh, very advanced algorithms which work on this. And this is just to show a very simple um, schematic of what that means. If you have a single eye vision, so if you, if you block one eye, and it doesn't really work if you block one eye because your brain, brain is automatically tuned to fill in for the other eye, so you can't really do this, but you can do this with the camera. So if you have a single camera and you point at something, you will, can only really see one real object, but you don't know exactly how far away it is. Okay, so you, have a, you can have a perception that it has many different distances. But if you had two eyes, Basically, both the eyes form two different images and they're shifted, so you have two different perspectives. And our brain has evolved such that these two images get filled in to form a three-dimensional image. Right? So we see the three-dimensional world. Um, and the same way you can design an optical system to do this. So the simplest system to do this, of course, is an eyepiece and a microscope, right? So I don't know if those of you who have seen a microscope with a single eyepiece, it's called a mono, monocle um, eyepiece, or a binocular eyepiece. And you will see the difference between them if you have looked at them. Okay? For a binocular eyepiece, of course, you need to design two optical paths, right? And sort of see, you can see it directly, but you basically form two different perspectives of the object, or two different images. The object, okay? two different optical systems. Um, yeah, I, that example is for also a, a rangefinder based on two different cameras looking down from a satellite, essentially. So if you have two different satellites taking images from two different locations and you know the relative distance between those two satellites, you can build a three dimensional map of what you were looking at, where the overlap images. Just the same way. It's just important when you do topography and things like that. <clears throat> One interesting thing coming back to recycling is that uh, a couple of interesting things in terms of how it's commercialized, which I thought was interesting and something you guys should be also aware of, uh, when you, uh, related to when you think about your own project. Uh, there are a couple of different ways uh, recycling markets work. For instance, you can have single use versus multi use. Single use where it means you have an aluminum can which is crushed up and converted into something else as a single use, it's not reused. Or you can have a glass bottle which is basically reused, it's multiple use. So you can have, and those different applications are completely different in terms of the commercialization strategy. This article is actually interesting, I'll post it online because it's written from a perspective of a company, an optics company which built these systems. So you can get a sense for what actually, what thought processes go into that. And there are also different markets where you have deposits for, for containers. So some states in the US have them, some states don't. And that also changes the market reality. 
and you have deposit, the participation of recycling is much, much higher. Okay, now why does that matter? Because if the participation is much higher, then you have a larger volume, then you need to deal with very fast, uh, very large scale sorting and things like that. Whereas it's much lower. But one interesting thing that happens apparently, and I wasn't aware of this, is when you have no, per the non-participants actually finance the big capital equipment because you, when you buy a can of soda or something, you already, you've already paid for the deposit. And if you do, do not recycle it, that money just sits around. And apparently that money gets sent for recycling programs. So it's kind of interesting in itself. Uh, in, if you have non-deposit markets uh, where it's just the municipalities or whatever that collect them, then you have um, the things that drive the market are essentially commodity prices that you can sell what is recycled for aluminum, copper, or whatever, things like that. And it's apparently a big business. So it turns out that very accurate sorting and efficient transportation are very key driving factors for this. So again, optics seems to give lots of very interesting solutions. Um, recycled plastics and sorting recycled plastics is very challenging. Why? Because all the plastics look the same. You can't just use two cameras. You can do, maybe you can do shape recognition and distinguish an aluminum can from a glass bottle from a, a plastic whatever. Um, but you cannot distinguish between the types of plastics. Right? You cannot uh, between the one to six or that kind of thing. Okay. The solution that this, this particular company was working on is based on near-infrared spectroscopy. Basically, the idea is that the different plastics have different signatures in the near-infrared. So if you, what does that mean? If you look, if you shine a, a, an infrared light through a piece of plastic and look at what comes out on the other side, it will have a specific signature with respect to the wavelength. And that's shown here for different plastics. So this is a polycarbonate, polyethylene, Kali, and so on and so forth. And you can see they have different dips. Okay, this is wavelength, and this is transmittance. So at certain wavelengths, they don't transmit at all. And that wavelength changes with the type of material. Yep? Does color affect this at all? That's a very good question. Now, the nice thing about infrared is it can pass through like paper and, and uh, most colored labels, because colored labels are reflecting visible light. They usually pass through infrared. So typically, it's a, it's a very important point, actually. Typically, what they do is they also have a camera, in addition to this sort of spectrometer as we'll talk about in a minute. So they can do both simultaneously. So if you have some, and of course, everything has to be controlled with some uh, control software, which kind of takes into account when one is happening versus the other is happening. OK. So of course, it needs to be done cheaply. And one relatively simple way to do it is based on correlation spectroscopy. It's, it's a very simple optical system, inexpensive. All you do is you take a halogen lamp, a mercury lamp, xenon lamp, something cheap, and you place the material that you are trying to sort in between the lamp and the detector. And the detector is a little bit expensive because you need to look at infrared, uh, based on what's called an Indian Galley Martian material. Okay. Now, of course, you don't want to use say, an expensive spectrometer. You don't want to actually measure spectra here because that would be expensive for cheap, cheap applications. So correlation spectroscopy, all it does is it, you place a filter wheel with the different plastics that you're interested in looking at. Okay, those are those. And you take two spectra, one through these filter wheels. So you, you spin the wheel. So you take a bunch of spectra through each of these things. Okay. So you take, you spin the wheel and take a spectrum. You basically, take a picture, right? But the, because the the, the 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 spectral range is very small, you can actually distinguish them very easily. Then you also take another picture with the plastic that you're interested in looking at, and which one, whichever one matches to one of these, you can say that's what that is. So that's as simple as that's what's called correlation spectroscopy. So you don't actually need to know exactly what the absolute spectra are. Uh, this is what a, one of those machines look like from the company from Norway. Uh, and you can see that's a plastic bottle and there's a laser which actually goes this way. There's a detector there. So fairly simple and actually goes through the labels and things like that. Okay. 
there's a more clever solution that some, some people have been working on is to, you still need some optics in order to do the imaging because you remember you're trying to still collect photons which pass through the material and you need to assign it to the detector and so on because they're not exactly the same shape and the size, right? The detector is small, so you need to collect the light. So you need to have some imaging systems like we just talked about. But which makes the thing kind of bulky and expensive still. So they came up with this very clever idea of using a refractive optical element for a low-cost spectrometer, and that's what it looks like. It's essentially a piece of plastic or glass which has some, uh, which has a computer-generated hologram, in, essentially. All it does is it takes the light from the source, and by source, what I mean is that that is the light that's coming after the plastic that you are looking at. It, that refractive optical element, which is also the DOE, basically splits the light into different spectral bands, as shown here. And by measuring all these spectral bands in a, in a single detector and separating them out in software, you can analyze the spectral signature very easily. Now, the big advantage of this is that this single element, this piece of plastic or glass, can do all the functions of beam splitting, spectrum separation, and focusing. So it's a very light, cheap, flexible solution. So it's a clever way to do optical design. In, our, in geometrical optics, obviously, we didn't talk about diffraction, right? Because we no diffraction. There was no diffraction because wavelength of light was very, very small in the so, but we'll talk later on about diffractive optical elements uh, for some applications in, so, in solar concentrators and so on. But this is an interesting application for recycling, for low-cost spectroscopy. Of course, another challenge here is to do very fast, very large-scale sorting. And as I mentioned before, this is important for when you have very uh, large amounts of waste, like municipal waste, things like that. Um, and you need to do it at high speed, high throughput. So, for instance, the, what they do today, you can go through about 30 tons of waste per hour. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, and in other words, you have to capture the spectra with spatial resolutions of a few centimeters. Because, you know, things could be small, right? You have lots of things coming by. And you need to catch them at really high speed. So you have to have high, you know, you need to design an optical system to do that. That's not trivial. They're expensive. The motivation, of course, as I mentioned before, is the material cost. So, so aluminum is, is that, you know, plastics cost that much, and they get, they get recycled. So there is a reasonable market for it. So aluminum gets converted, of course, into containers and so on. Uh, plastics, some of them, <coughs> get converted into fleece and fabrics and things like that. This is an example of a, a large-scale uh, system where what they do essentially is basically you have a conveyor belt running the material and you have a scanner which essentially sends the infrared light and the visible light and scans it across orthogonal to the conveyor belt. And you look at the reflected light. Either reflected light can be reflected, which is what's done here, as they say, say, or you can do it in transmission if you have a transparent aperture based conveyor. You can do it both ways. And you can see in this particular case, there are some robots which does the separation in this particular schematic. So again, you can do either two cameras to do shape recognition in conjunction with spectroscopy, to do near infrared spectroscopy. And that's just a picture of that. Um, OK, so the only purpose, uh, this is my last slide. But, uh, my purpose of showing this to you is to give you, again, another flavor of a very different industry where optical engineering is applied. And as you think about your projects where you know, optics may not be the most natural application, I think you have to think creatively on how, how, how you can apply optics to improve the, the, the current state of the art in what you're doing. So hopefully in the last few weeks you've, you've thought about very carefully about the pros and cons and the limitations and the advantages of all the different approaches that exist today. And the next report, remember, you have to think about how you can improve it. Hopefully with optics, but you know, so somehow think creatively.